All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our post-secondary transition resources for parents here in Falls Church City Public Schools. My name is Rebecca Sharp. I am the Executive Director of Special Education Student Services here in the school division. I'm so excited to have our amazing guests and our wonderful Elizabeth McCarthy, who is our own Falls Church City Public Schools a secondary transition specialist. She works out of Meridian High School and supports um, our students with disabilities on their journeys to their post-secondary goals. Before I turn it over to them, just a few housekeeping notes. If you're a participant here with us, I just want to remind you to mute yourself. We are recording this session, so um, those of you who are here with us in person, we'll receive a copy of it. And then we will also get a copy of the handouts from our presenters and those will be sent out to everyone. I hope you enjoy this session. We are incredibly lucky to have these representatives from DARS and the CSB here with us this morning for our session. And I will now turn it over to Ms. McCarthy. Good morning. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, like Ms. Sharp said that this is kind of a, a one of many of the, the parent webinars that we are going to try um, to set up this year just to um, disseminate information a little bit um, more clearly and then also um, to make sure that all of our parents know different types of supports that are available within the district. We are super lucky that we are a small but mighty district in ourselves, but sometimes people um, don't understand like the full scope of services that we have um, that are combined and in collaboration with Fairfax. So um, we share the um, community services board with Fairfax and then also with the Department of Aging and Rehab Services. We also share with Fairfax. So a lot of times we don't have anything, you know, that is Falls Church City specific, but it's wonderful because we fall under this umbrella of Fairfax services as well. And I truly believe that it is two of the agency's best departments. Um, I've been with Meridian and Falls Church for 20 years. And so a lot of this sometimes falls to me as information, old information that I, you know, I think that most everyone knows that we have to offer. Um, but we have, you know, we know that new parents and new students and um, information needs to continuously be brought to the table so parents know. Community Services Board and Department of Aging and Rehab Services are two state agencies that we make referrals to of students who are in Falls Church City. They both play specific roles um, for services within high school and then also for services after high school. Um, they're are, there can be overlap of services. There can be students who qualify for both. There can be students who may qualify for one or the other. And that's where things can get a little confusing. So although this is one of many times you, you will hear this information, please reach out to me with any questions. Um, along with the information, we do kind of have um, a, a visual that can show the different services the agencies offer, how they you know, interlace and collaborate, and then also the things that they do differently and the different types of adult living and high school um, education instruction training that they that they provide. Um, so we will first start with the Community Services Board. Today, we are super lucky to have Sherry Hassel and Aaron Lauer with us. Um, Sherry has been with the Falls Church Fairfax Community Services Board DDS for the last 16 years, and she is currently the Transition Supervisor for Developmental Disability Services. During her tenure at the Community Services Board, Sherry has worked as the DD Waiver Support Coordinator, DD Transition, that is um, Developmental Disability Support Coordinator, and Developmental Disability Intake Support Coordinator, and a Program Coordinator with Residential Services. She has a Master's in Counseling from Marymount University. Erin has been with the Community Services Board for the last 10 years and is currently the Intake Supervisor for Developmental Disability Services. She holds an MSW and MPH from the University of California at Berkeley and is a licensed clinical social worker. And having she worked in Virginia, Massachusetts, and California. Um, 
She has been a member of the ACSD and has three children at Madison High School um, and one son with an IEP. So these are wonderful. I can't tell you how many times I have leaned on both of them for information and quick emails about our students. Um, and so I'm going to let them take it from here. Okay, great. Well, um, let me share my screen. I'm going to give a, uh, Aaron and I are giving a brief overview of CSB services. So let me see if my screen sharing works. Tell me if you can see this. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, yes. great. Sorry, and I forgot to add, if there's questions, we're going to do questions and answers at the end. Um, after community, uh, community services board wraps, then we'll dive into our DARS presentation. And if you have questions, um, just input them in the chat. So don't feel like you have to wait and um, write them down. You can just put them into the chat. And then when we get to that Q&A session at the end, I will read them and make sure that we get all of them um, addressed. Great. All right. Let me. Okay. So what is a CSB? Um, CSBs are um, who we are is we are the Fairfax Falls Church Community Services Board. Um, we were established in 1969. And, and the uh, Fairfax Falls Church CSB. Are you all are you hearing all an echo? Sorry. Or make sure everyone mutes themselves. Sorry, I was just, I was hearing an echo. Sorry, it was, it was a little distracting, but let me start again. Um, we're with the Fairfax Falls Church Community Services Board. Um, uh, Community Services Board is a public agency that provides services for people in the community that have mental health or behavioral health needs, substance use disorders, or developmental disabilities. Um, Fairfax Falls Church is one of the 40 CSBs in Virginia, and we serve currently around 200,000 individuals. We're the largest CSB in all of Virginia. Our mission and where we, we try and coordinate um, services in the community, um, what we wanna do, we wanna make sure that everyone has the supports that are needed to live healthy, fulfilling lives in our community. Um, there's different types of uh, th these are some of the areas that we have within the CSB. Um, both Aaron and I work on under the um, umbrella of developmental disabilities, but there's also children, youth, and families. There's also mental health, which is also known as behavioral health, substance use disorder, and prevention and wellness. Um, getting started, there's referrals as far as when you, depending upon what services you're looking for, if it's emergency services, there's also Maryfield Center, which is now known as the Sharon Bulova Center. I'll need to update this slide. Um, and also emergency services, which you all will have a copy of this slide um, with that when, when um, it'll be disseminated between you all. For developmental disability services for intake, how you would apply for services. The first way of doing that is to call the CSB Developmental Disability Services main line. Our main line is 703-324-4400. Uh, After that, you're gonna be linked with um, a DD intake staff that will answer all of your initial questions and will get information and gather information and send you more uh, information for uh, the the end the end result will be having a, a meeting, um, but they're going to schedule. Um, that'll be the last part of it, and the in the in the middle they'll be gathering eligibility determination um, to determine whether your your son or daughter or loved one is eligible for our services. Um, and typically the, the DD intake office is uh, is at the Panino Building. We're right across from the government center. Um, I know that the and I know this is Aaron's specialty, but uh, as far as I do know that they they are very accommodating. They'll come to schools to do intakes. They'll also meet at families' homes, depending upon the need. But typically, our our intake meetings are held at the Panino Building. Um, just to give you some brief overview, and this is something that if you are interested in and you're and you're doing a referral for DD services. Um, they will go into this much more in detail, but this is just sort of a, a brief overview that to be eligible for um, the DD waiver wait list and to be eligible for the Community Services Board Developmental Disability Services, um, 
your your um, son or daughter or loved one will need to have a, di a documented diagnosis of a developmental disability with the onset um, before age 22 or before age 18 if the qualifying developmental diagnosis is an intellectual disability. And then you have to have three uh, significant uh, support. Their individual will have to have at least three uh, areas of categories of significant support needs. Um, typically, that's gathered through um, through school testing or private testing, adaptive assessments. That's where the intake support coordinator will be gathering that information to determine eligibility. And then once you meet that initial eligibility, it's determined that you meet all of those areas. Then the last part will be to have the intake meeting where you'll you'll complete what's known as the, the Virginia Individual Developmental Disability Eligibility Survey. We always call it the VIDES because that's a mouthful. And basically all that is, is it's an assessment tool that's going to be administered by the CSB intake staff during the eligibility appointment. That's the last level to determine whether um, the, the, your your individual meets the our, um, the the eligibility criteria. Um, some things to remember for eligibility is that it's not necessary for an individual to have a social security number to be eligible for local funding DDS services. Um, but a social security number is required to be placed on the statewide waitlist for DD waiver, um, the waitlist for the DD waivers. Um, if a person is determined eligible for DD services, um, the individual would have potential um, access to case management or support coordination services. You'd be placed on the uh, DD waiver wait, statewide wait list, access to different types of programs that are through the, the, um, uh, the state, which is, for example, the DBA, the Developmental Behavioral Developmental Services uh, Individual Family Support Program. That's a, a grant that's uh, that's um, people are eligible for if you're on that wait list, at least annually. Um, and then access to transition services for students who are graduating or aging out of school services. If a person's eligible for DD services, the individual would have um, uh, in their aging out of school um, or graduating with a standard or, or advanced diploma, um, they're, they're potentially eligible for vocational support funding. Um, and we're, of course, we're non-mandated services. So it's pending the Board of Supervisors approval, which is the budgets determined annually. Um, access to uh, respite subsidy programs for people who don't have waiver funding, um, and then access to uh, drop-in residential supports for people who are 18 years or older. Um, I won't go into too much detail, but as far as there's the the there's the umbrella of the the DD waivers, and under the gen under the DD waivers, there's three different types of waivers that fall under that umbrella. There's the building independence waiver. That's for people who have, who are 18 or above and they're able to live independently in the community and they may not need as many supports. Um, the family and individual support waiver and the community living waiver are very similar. They provide a lot of different supports for individuals such as in-home supports, respite, assistant uh, technology, um, day support or employment supporting uh, options, crisis supports. Um, the main difference between the family and individual support waiver and the community living waiver is that the community living waiver has that 24-hour residential group home component. Um, and I looked up this morning, right now on uh, in Fairfax County, um, as of this morning, there are 2,956 people on, on the wait list. Um, there's... And a wait list. Uh, once you're on the waiver wait list, it's a it's a it's a needs based wait list. It's not uh, chronological. So this is how they're determining the priority. Um, priority are the people who are determined most in need, um, and those are determined through different assessments that are given during your your intake. Um, there's right now there's 1,131 individuals on priority one status. There's uh, a little over 1,200 uh, on priority two, and then uh, there's 464 on priority three level of some um, waitlist facts. Uh, 
the CSB determines if an individual is eligible for the DD waiver waitlist, um, and we place them on the on the waitlist, and um, and we help maintain the current information regarding their support needs. Um, as I said just in the previous slide, the DD waiver is needs based; it's not chronological. Um, and the individuals are assessed to be in greatest need when waiver slots become available um, to receive the waiver. Um, one of the things is that the the uh, state of Virginia is the one who uh, then once once uh, uh, slots are allocated by the state, um, there there are, there's a, a committee which is made up of um, by uh, the state of Virginia that facilitates a, a committee to determine who's greatest in need. They're the ones that review to determine. Um, the CSB does not award waiver slots. We do not have, um, we help maintain the waiver wait list and to update it, but we do not make determinations on who gets a waiver or what type of waiver they're given or the timelines. Um, but that's, we help maintain you while your your individuals on that waiver wait list. And if in the future, if your individual um, received a waiver, then you would have a support coordinator assigned to you as well that would help you uh, ne uh, navigate the, the waivers and, and the needs. Um, for transition services, which I know a lot of you all are, are, are interested in, um, the CSB transition services, um, we, as in the, the Fairfax Falls Church CSB, um, we provide, we have a cooperative agreement with uh, the, the CSB does, as well as with um, Fairfax County Public Schools and DARS. We work very close together. We'll have the, during the final year of a student's transition, um, all three agencies will work together with the student and the family in developing a transition um, plan after high school. Um, some of the things that this might include are competitive employment, group supported employment, a day program, um, post-secondary education such as NOVA or, or GMU, um, or there's something also called, um, there's a, a more individualized program that's specific to Fairfax County for CSB funded individuals and it's called self-directed services. One of the things also just to remember, unlike uh, public schools um, that are mandated services, the CSB are, um, services are optional and they're based on availability of funding and an individual is willing to participate in these services. And there's two primary sources of funding for vocational or day and employment services in Fairfax County. Uh, for DD services. There's the Fairfax County local funding. So that's like the state funding, or I'm not sorry, the county funding rather, um, the Fairfax County uh, funding, which is allocated to the CSB annually. It has to be approved by the board of supervisors through the county's annual budget. And then there's the other uh, side of the funding, which could be the Medicaid waiver, which is the state funding, which is appropriated annually by the Virginia General Assembly. These are just a few contacts throughout that might be helpful. You guys will get a copy of this. And the questions, I think we're waiting until the end. So I think that was the end of the presentation. Um, so let me, let me stop, sorry. I'm, I'm having, trying to, oh, there it is, stop, share. Sorry about that. A little technical difficulty, but I think that's it on, on the CSB. That's sort of, I know it's a lot of information. It's just sort of giving you a, a, a brief overview of what services are, are available. Um, and Aaron and I will be available to answer more detailed questions once we're, I think, at the end of the presentation. But thank you for your time and thanks for participating. Thank you so much. Um, next, we will dive into Department of Aging and Rehab Services. We are super lucky to have Julie Paradiso with her. She's our counselor from the DARS office. Um, kind of duly um, wonderful about our relationship with her. She's also an FCCPS parent. Um, and so as we talk about supports and services that DARS offer, it's, it's pretty 
great to have um, someone who lives within the city kind of off, offer opportunities for our students within the city. Sometimes we can find um, different unique opportunities for the students because she has a little bit more of a, like a finger on the pulse of different businesses and organizations and resources within the city itself. Um, she is a counselor um, at the Dars Fairfax office right now. She has a master's degree in clinical psychology and counseling and is a CRC certified rehabilitation counselor. Um, she carries an adult and youth caseload case and provides students with IEPs and 504 plans at Meridian with the support that they need to prepare for their transition out of high school onto their vocational path. Um, she also works for other high schools within Fairfax. She works at Marshall High School and a variety of local organizations such as Homestretch and Turning Point to serve people with disabilities who want to work competitively. Um, so Julie, uh, and I know um, Julie currently has one at the middle school, one at a senior at Meridian, just graduated one from Meridian and one who is uh, went to Meridian and is um, in college as well. So Julie, take it away. Thank you. It is such a great pleasure to get to work in the community with um, a lot of different families I see in lots of different contexts around. So, um, and what I hear a lot from people is that they don't even know DARS existed. Why didn't I know about this program? <laughs> so I'm gonna share a little bit about DARS and um, open it up for questions at the end. And I'm going to share my screen. Okay, is that showing for everybody? Okay, I kept a comprehensive slideshow here since it will be dispersed to everyone, but there are some slides we're gonna go through pretty quickly because in the sake of time, um, DARS is a pretty big organization and um, I don't know if I know how to advance. <laughs> Liz, how do I advance? Um, when I'm not sharing, I just do it with my little side button, but um, sorry for the technical there, difficulty here. There should be something on the bottom. If you look at the bottom of your, you should be able to, is there something where you can press forward? Mm -mm. Nope. I might just go, um, let me try this again. Sorry, everybody. There we go. Okay, my buttons were just sticky. So um, we're not gonna talk about our objectives today. Our objective is to help you understand what DARS is and DARS role with your student and how DARS can continue working with your student when they're no longer a student. So DARS is the Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services. So you see why we call it DARS, it's kind of a mouthful, but our role is to improve employment, quality of life, security and independence for older Virginians and Virginians with disabilities and their families. So it's a federal state combo program and um, we offer what's called vocational rehab services to anyone that has a disability and says they wanna work. So we don't have a wait list. If you come to our office and you say, I have a disability and I think that I'm capable of work, your case will be open. Um, so this is a little bit of an overview because there's a lot that is under that umbrella of DARS. So we have five different subsections of DARS, the Division of Rehabilitative Services, which is what I'm under. Um, and you can see we cover vocational rehabilitation. So that is for adults traditionally, but students can also move into that service. Pre-employment transition services, which is what we provide for students. And then the Wilson Workforce Rehabilitation Center. And that is a campus for vocational training. Um, there used to be a lot more in this country. I think there's down to maybe five left. 
but it's kind of a unique setting where you have that on-campus college experience, we use it to provide in-depth, um, immersive vocational evaluations. And then students can also go there or adults can go there to get training done. So if you have a certificate program you'd like to do that traditionally would be local training, you can go live on campus, take part in all of the recreation and social skills offerings, but then also leave there with your certification. Um, Division for Community Living covers aging services and disability programs and no wrong door. And then we also have the Disability Determination Services Department, the Office of State Long-Term Care Ombudsman, and Adult Protective Services. So if you go to our website, you can get more in-depth information on all that. And if you do open a case with DARS, um, you'll get a flyer that explains what all those things are. Um, so... For, for my role, I work under the DRS, what used to be called the DRS, and we work only in employment. So while those other parts of DARS can cover some other things, our primary goal is employment and all the things that it takes to prepare for, choose, secure, and then keep that employment. Because for a lot of individuals, keeping the employment is kind of the real trial. Um, and we're only focused on competitive integrated employment. So some of you may be familiar with what used to be called sheltered workshops or some of the group supported settings that people can work in. With DARS, you have to be interested in working in a job that anybody could apply for. And um, the wages are uh, the same as they would be for anyone in that position at the level that you're at. So there's no subpar wages and there's no set aside jobs for people with disabilities. Um, so it gets a little confusing because there's a lot of acronyms, but we have things broken up into two sections. One is VR. So that's strictly those vocational rehabilitation services. Those are for adults and for students who might need a little bit more support as they transition out of high school. And then we have Pre-EDS, which is pre-employment transition services. These services are only for people who are in some sort of educational environment. So that could be a training program, that could be high school, that could be um, the special ed services that some students continue on until age 22, um, could be college or community college. But these are geared specifically towards younger people to help them prepare for adult life. So why do we do pre-employment transition services? It's a fairly new idea. And it came about um, after the Workforce Investment Act of 2014. So a lot of research went into showing that students are not adequately prepared to achieve success. Now, I'm assuming most of you are parents of students. This doesn't go just for students with disabilities. It's a lot of students you know, would benefit from pre-ed services. But students with disabilities in particular were less likely to graduate high school or attend college or training programs post high school. They were ending up in jobs that had less options, maybe minimum wage hourly jobs. There's an increase in things like homelessness and job hopping. Um, so Prietz was um, developed to expand opportunities for students and to provide them with our services at an earlier age. So instead of having to wait till 18, students can engage in um, vocational rehab starting at age 14. Um, so the law states that we need to provide these services now. So they enhance preparation for employment and post-secondary life. So acknowledging that not everybody wants to go to college, not everyone's career requires college, um, maybe an apprenticeship, maybe on the job training, maybe a certificate program, maybe going straight into the workforce. So there's lots of options. We help students figure out what's best for them with their strengths, skills, and abilities. And then we increase the opportunities for them to get out in the community, explore those career interests, practice those job readiness skills, and then make good informed decisions for themselves instead of just, you know, picking something um, because their friends like it or it sounds good, helping them arm themselves with good information. And this increases the options for students with disabilities as they leave high school. They've got more ideas, they know what their training options are, they can get credentials, and then meaningful post-secondary employment. DARS tends to be really focused on careers, not just jobs. 
sometimes a job is what's needed, especially if it's that first job, but we want to make sure that you're increasing your independence over the course of your life. So who can receive pre-eds? Um, any student that has a disability. So any student that's been identified with a 504 plan or an IEP is eligible. Um, they don't have to have a social security card to be eligible for pre-ed services. This is a special case type that stands for pre-eligible, so P-E. Um, they have to, um, usually they're connected to me through Liz. They're on her caseload or she's aware of them. But occasionally parents will say, well, my student doesn't have a 504 and IEP, but they do have this diagnosis and we can get connected that way as well. Um, PE does not mean you're eligible for VR services. There's a little bit more to that, but we'll get into that in a minute. So the primary things that we provide in pre -ed, and I would consider this sort of like the appetizer to VR services, it's students get to dip their toe in, and see what it's about getting prepared for work. So we do job exploration counseling um, where we can talk about anything that they're interested in. We look to some assessments, try if they don't know what their interests are and help them look at the careers and see if they are what they think they are. Um, we help them engage a work-based learning experience. So Liz mentioned some of the community connections. We might go out for inter informational interviews. We have a lot of job shadows we set up and we talk to the students when we do that. We figure out what they're interested in and then go out in the community and talk to community members and business owners who might be able to provide information and expertise to our students. We want them to gain knowledge and um, skills to choose what's a good fit for them going forward. Counseling on educational opportunities. Again, they might not need college. They might need college. What does that look like? How are they going to pay for it? Um, how long do they have to do this? So there's a lot of things we can do to help them learn more about what comes next after high school. Workplace readiness training is all those soft skills that they need at every job, right? The knowing how to check their schedule, knowing how to talk to somebody who's not talking nice to them, knowing how to advocate for themselves, show up on time, do the parts of the job that are not that fun. Um, and then instructions on self-advocacy. So, you know, Liz and I talk a lot in our meetings with the students about how they have so many people advocating on their behalf while they're in high school. They've got these great supportive teams. They've got their parents right there. And it's time for them to learn how to speak up for themselves about what they need. So how to access pre-eds, um, they just need to um, let, you know, if you, your student, your son or your daughter wants to access pre-eds, they can let Liz know. Um, you can also connect with me directly. My information is going to be at the end of this presentation. Um, and it's important, I think, to know that this is on a continuum. So pre-eds can lead seamlessly to VR services, but not every student requires or wants VR services. These are, um, you know, not mandatory services, similar to the CSB, they're voluntary, they're there to help, they're student guided, they're completely individualized, but not everybody wants to work with ours once they graduate. Um, all of our services for pre are fully funded, they're at no charge um, to the student, the student's family, the school district. Um, but there needs to be a need for one of those five pre ed services. And if a student works with us in pre eds, we need to provide one of those services every quarter um, in order for them to stay on my caseload. Uh, most of these students are going to be under 18, so they're going to need a signed consent from the parent. And Liz has all that paperwork, and I can also provide it for you. And we just do a little short intake to kind of get to know the student a little bit better and see where we can best serve them. And then um, that's that pre -ed survey. And then Liz can provide the IEP or 504 plan if you sign a release for her, or you can provide it to me as well. And then again, we need to make satisfactory progress. We don't want to open up a case and just have them not want to do anything. There's going to be a lot of opportunities for them to take advantage of things. So if they decide they really don't want to take advantage of anything, we might say, well, come back later when you're ready. Um, so what that leads into is vocational rehab services. And these have an eligibility process. Students can have a VR case, but adults can only have a VR case. So VR um, helps people with disabilities get ready to choose, find, um, prepare for, and keep a job. 
It increases their ability to live independently in the community because they're funding their own life and maybe they are supplementing social security benefits or, you know, avoiding being on social security benefits. Um, we work with every type of disability. So my caseload has people with substance abuse um, disabilities, physical, mental health, emotional, cognitive, um, and sometimes a variety of all of those things. Um, but it is an eligibility program. And I'll get into that in just a second. So these are some of the core services in vocational rehab. We provide guidance and counseling similar to what we do in pre ets career exploration, we have a lot of vocational testing we can engage in. We have a vocational evaluator who works with us at the Fairfax office. Um, we also have Wilson that we can send people to for more intensive week-long evaluations. We have a neuropsychologist that we use to provide those types of evaluations. Um, job seeking skills. So all of those things that go into, hey, is this job a good fit for me? Am I qualified to apply for it? Do I know how to write a resume? Do I know how to interview? Who can be my references? All of those job finding and getting skills. And then we also offer services in supported employment. And so that's for an individual who maybe needs a little bit more help learning the job or getting the job, these services phase out over time. So you might work with a job coach to help you learn the job, connect with your employer, um, set up accommodations, but then that job coach will slowly phase out over time and you'll be independent in your job. We do also assist with vocational training. Sometimes that can mean college, sometimes it means apprenticeships, sometimes it means certification programs or on the job training. And then we also, oops, can help with adapting equipment and devices and worksite accommodations, home accommodations, especially for people with physical disabilities. We've sometimes done like a car modification or worksite modification. So we have an AT specialist who works with us in our office and she might go out into the worksite and see what's hard for you, what can be done. She's got kind of a MacGyver lab where a lot of things have been crafted over the years to assist people with doing the task that they may not be able to do otherwise. So here's just a cute little graphic with some moving parts <laughs> to, to show all of those different things. So there's no fee for DARS. Um, again, all of these services that are in-house are at no cost to the participant. There are occasionally costs associated with some of the things we decide to do together. So if we have to pay some someone else, say you want a training program, but you can't afford it, um, then we can look at your financial eligibility to see if we can fund that thing for you. Otherwise, we work with you to figure out, okay, is there another option or how can you fund it? Are there other resources to get you what you need? Um, if you are a person that has SSI or SSDI, DARS does automatically fund things like training programs, tools, sometimes interview clothes, things like that. But all of these things have to be related to work. So this is a little breakdown of what is a no cost service versus a cost service. I'm not gonna go through all of these right now, you'll have this presentation, but you can see there's a wide variety of services that can be put on your plan to help you get the job you want. Um, and a lot of that is at no cost. And again, if you are under a certain income level or you have SSI or SSDI, it will still be at no cost to you. So some things DARS is not. DARS is not a placement agency. We don't have jobs we're trying to fill. We don't have quotas for certain types of career paths. It's about building independence. So we're here. We like to say, like, we're the GPS, right? You're the driver. We're going to give you a lot of paths and you're picking ultimately the path that's the best fit for you based on all this information you're gathering. Um, but it's up to you to choose your job goal, what's a good fit for you, what you want to do, what's the level of income you want, um, the, all of those things. And you have to be participating. So if you're not showing up for things, if you only check in once a year, because this is voluntary, your DARS counselor will talk to you about maybe closing your case. However, you can have as many DARS cases as you want over the course of your lifetime. So if you find it's not a good fit for you right now, you can always open a case at a later date. Um, so we cannot pay for services that um, are not needed also. Sometimes students or adults want things that would benefit them, but 
are not actually needed for that employment goal. So those are not things that can be covered by DARS. Um, so to be eligible for vocational rehab, um, and this is that main entree in the DARS services, you have to have documentation of a physical, mental, emotional, or learning disability or sensory disability. Um, and that can be medical records. It can be, sometimes it can even start with the IEP or 504 plan. Um, that disability needs to create a barrier to you getting the employment that you want. So some disabilities don't actually create a barrier. You've learned how to work around them, cope with them. So there has to be an impediment to what you want to do. And then it has to be reasonable for you to work. So in a competitive and integrated environment. So some disabilities may be so profound that competitive and integrated work isn't really a realistic choice at that time. Um, so, but if you, if you think it is, we will always take your application and work through this all with you. We won't ever turn anyone away who wants to work. Um, you have to be legal to work in the United States. So this is where you do need a social security card because we have state and federal funding. We have to prepare people who can legally work in the US for work. Um, you have to live or work in Virginia or go to school in Virginia and be willing and able to work. Um, we do have a DARS in every state. They have different names, but if you move and you're like, hey, are there vocational rehab services here? There are, and I can help connect you to those things. For college students, if they go to school out of state, they're still a Virginia resident. So if you want to apply, um, if you're not involved in school, where Liz would connect you with me, you can call my office and go right through the front desk and they will um, hook you up with a counselor who will do an intake. For intake, you need a little bit of documentation, your social security card, and a photo ID. So those are those I-9 documents that you need to work. Um, disability documentation and health insurance information if you have it. And if you're under 18, a signature from a, a legal guardian. Okay, Wilson Workforce. We're not gonna talk about in great detail, but this is that place that we discuss where we can do vocational training. Um, it'll be on your slide. We do have a specialized program that is of interest to parents of students called PERT. Um, and Liz gets a few slots of PERT every year and we send students to go when all the other students across the state of Virginia are attending. And they do a really immersive vocational evaluation of their choice. They also do like recreational evaluation, social, independent living skills. So it's a great way for your student to A, go and stay over for a week somewhere new if they haven't been a participant in like sleepaway camp, build some independent skills there learn about budgeting, learn about laundry, learn about grocery shopping and meal planning, and then also get to try out some careers of interest. And I think Liz can speak to also all the students who have gone, have been really pleased with the experience, really enjoyed it, um, and we get a lot out of it. So these are some of the things that they can try out when they're at Wilson. And again, you'll have this slide, but you can see there's a wide variety of things. It's not just the building trades. We have a lot of different services and hospitality, IT, business. Um, and then students can go back there for vocational training if it's a good fit and they do well on their assessment. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. I know it was pretty long. Thank you so much for presenting. Um, I think, I mean, it is a wealth, a lot, wealth of information. Um, if anyone has any questions they would like to put in the chat, um, I do think it's important to know um, or and to think about how sometimes these um, agencies can work together. So, um, Julie, I was wondering if, you could, and then Sherry, to talk about like a, an example or how sometimes when we come close to graduation or when a student might exit out, how, you know, what is an example or how do the different, um, how do the two agencies work together? Sure. And I'll, I'll give my perspective from the DARS side and Sherry can correct me because <laughs> I, I don't want to, um, you know, speak to her program at all. But an example, a recent example of a student we had that exited, this student exited um, at 22. 
So when they um, could no longer receive special education services through the school district. But while the student was getting ready to exit, they were talking about really wanting to work. And we shared a lot of information about some of the career interests and looked at lots of different things to different assessments and hands-on things. And the student identified that they really loved um, food service and really wanted to make food, prep food, um, be around food, serve food to people. The student was really social and really hardworking and um, engaged in a lot of the different things that we could do together. So as the student decided to exit, we connected them to a job that is kind of a hybrid between that competitive integrated employment and that group supported employment. There's enough people without disabilities working on this site that um, it's considered integrated for my purposes, but it also has a lot of support um, because the manager is actually like a team lead counselor and there are other individuals with disabilities on the team. So we have a contract through Service Source that um, works out at Quantico and this student uh, got a job in the mess hall at Quantico serving FBI cadets. So they have a new group of cadets every six weeks and get to lo meet lots of new people and has moved their way up into um, lots of different skills is now the panini maker, which is really exciting for them. Um, it was um, all they wanted to do right now. And um, so they're very fulfilled by work. They make a really great wage, but we um, kind of combined forces with their CSB um, case manager because, because since it's not exactly competitive and integrated, once the student was ready to close their DARS case because your DARS case closes after you've been stable in your employment um, that you've chosen for at least 90 days. Um, CSB kind of took over and they funded their long-term employment supports. So that's like three hours a month just of that job coaching that provides them that support they need to stay stable on that job for the long-term. So they know the job, they're comfortable there, but that long-term employment support helps them stay stable in case something comes up, they just need to talk to somebody, they need to get trained on something new and it's stressful. So that would be an example of a, a partnership that we've had recently that worked really well for competitive employment for this student. And I guess I'll jump in at this point. And yeah, Julie made some good points and that's typically what the the CSB will work with DARS very closely. Um, and uh, that's a really good example. A lot of the times, especially with the CSB funded, um, funding typically will go through DARS first for more competitive employment. That would be the, the they would start the funding source. But as, as she said, it's more of a short-term funding. We're more of the longer-term funding where we would pick up once, as, as she, as the, the example that she just used is perfect, um, the more competitive um, site, the DARS worker will be funding the, the job coach or the supports to do that in the very beginning. And then once, once it's stable and once you find out that it's been working, then what you end up doing is a person, although might benefit from having a drop in from time to time, having somebody just touch base and have a uh, problem solving if something comes up, you know, if something comes up or needs help with it, that's where the follow along um funding would come with the CSB. That would be a good example. Also, if we have somebody who's working in a more of a, a, a supported employment or a day support um, where they've been they've been placed and they're interested in, in now and they've kind of built their skills and they're ready to move and they want to readdress whether they want to do competitive employment. That's when we will, when the CSB will work with the agency that they're, uh, the provider that they're working at, like if they're with Service Source, for example, would also then work with DARS to then uh, work toward that, that um, because uh, to work toward the competitive employment piece to, to keep expanding their skills and to see whether that's something that, because DAR, that's something that DARS, that's their expertise is to determine whether somebody is really ready for that, that competitive employment um placement and they'll do assessments. And so we, we really work in tandem with, with, I think we really complement one another um, uh, as far as the DARS funding and the CSB funding, we try and 
work it out to make sure that we try and support the person the best that we can. Um, and I think that, you know, but the the DARS funding is more short term and the CSB is more long term supports. Um, and also, I think the other example is, and Julie, you could help me a little bit. Um, we have a student who graduated with a standard diploma, was un didn't had a had a career path in mind. Um, started out is going to Nova, but so Dars didn't necessarily Dars did preets with this student and participated in different. Um, vocational things within high school, but then actually the the agency who picked up right after high school with CSB through help with the college steps program. Um, so that's another example to where Dars said you know, did the pre services in high school, but then the student was like, I would like to go to Nova. Uh, college steps is a program at Nova that helps support students, and there are different programs at many different colleges like that. And so this student was eligible for CSB support. And so CSB then stepped in. So there are a lot of different ways that they work together in, in different um, situations. And we continue to um, dually support that student. So the student gets the benefit of the CSB funding for college steps, which is that really that help while they're in college to make sure that they're learning how to be a good college student, right? And staying on track. But at the same time, that person is still working with me, um, looking at opportunities for work in their career path of choice. We do summer internships, we do work experiences, job shadowing. So they can still take advantage of all of those great things because when you hit college, you don't have all the information to make the informed choices for the rest of your life. You know, let's be honest. So these these services continue. And then once they've graduated from college, actually the student it, um, does have a VR case too. So they they get pre-ed services and also VR services. So once they graduate, um, we'll help them prepare for a job, whether it's getting that internship that they need, whether it's making connections, whether it's helping them um, get their resume and their interview skills really great. We'll see them through that whole process to get that job out of college. Um, so even though we're short-term supports, which Sherry's 100% accurate on that, a VR case does end once you're stable in the job you chose on your plan. Short-term supports for a student could mean like seven or eight, nine years sometimes because we're seeing them through high school, college. I've seen them through um, master's programs and then into that job seeking piece and then that attainment of the job they chose. Um, all right. Well, any questions? Any questions? Um, well, thank you again to our wonderful presenters. Um, we, um, it really is, like I said in the beginning, um, we are truly lucky that we have a very small um, school district that can utilize such um, a wide, um, expansive net of services. And, um, as, you know, just to reiterate for the, d d for DARS, you know, if you haven't heard from me, um, most of the time we do try, you know, it's starting in ninth grade. If your students are in strategies for success, it's, it's probably, you know, a high probability that in some way, shape or form pre ets will be, um, introduced to them through that strategies class. We're really making a push into the those classes um, by 10th, 11th grade. I mean, always reach out if you if you have questions or would like to talk about um, timelines for referrals. I am here to help with a CSB referral that also can be done um, at any time. Um, I can provide paperwork. We'll just need like a, a, a release form signed, um, but that can also be done just um, through the family um, or um, special people in a student's life who um, would like to make that referral. But I'm here to answer questions at any time. Thank you so much. Thank you to our pre presenters. And um, I hope everyone has a wonderful day.
and continue to look out for some other fun um, and wonderful sessions. We will information sessions we'll have set up for parents. Thank you, Liz. And I see Sean Robertson asked if the students have already been introduced to Priets and Dars. So I'll let you answer. That. <laughs> yes, um, so, so I hope. But yes, if your student, if your student is in a strategies class, um, they have received information. Um, one of the things we do through the strategies for in strategies for success classes at the high school is we offer a program that is called Finding Your Futures. Um, that is a program that is offered. We're running it through two strategies classes this year. We did it in about two classes last year. Once we get all of those students who have finished Finding Your Futures one, we will be starting Finding Your Futures two. Um, and so uh, the that will that will actually include over eighty percent of our targeted students who have been brought to us through case managers and or parents and or just discussions at um, IEP or five hundred four meetings. And then the other twenty percent, when Julie comes into the school, we sit down and talk about okay, if there is that student who's never had. For example, we do have students who don't have time in their schedule for strategies for success. So we have a list of those students and then we pull those students in during um, extended the extended Mustang block on Monday or times where they have in their schedule um, that we can meet and talk to them. So there are, um, we have, you know, there's different forms of permission slips. So if you have any questions, if your child needs to have permission slips signed for the Priet, if they have um, that is a good question, Julie. Is there a um, timeline? So if a student had signed the Priets last year for Finding Your Futures, not for DARS, because I know it's an open case, but for Finding Your Futures, is that annual? We'll have to do maybe do another one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I'll have all those um, available. And I'm at the school one or two times a month. But if your student hasn't heard of DARS or Priets for some reason, and you want to set up a call. I know Liz and I try to do um, parent information sessions and I was there at back to school night, but still, you know, everybody's busy and sometimes information gets missed. So just reach out. We can do individualized information sessions just to fill in any gaps or see if it's a good fit for your student. Um, so yeah, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, beautiful. It's 11 o'clock on the dot. Um, hope everyone um, has a wonderful day. Reach out with any questions. Thank you all.